Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome to your Linux and open source news video. We'll cover everything starting from the beginning of January up to now and starting from this video, the news are going to be weekly, so stay tuned for that every Thursday, new news video. This time around, we've got KD Plasma 5.24 releasing and taking a page from Gnome's book, We've got Epic Games admitting themselves that their own anti-cheat software isn't up to the task, at least on Linux, and the Steam Deck has been sent to multiple reviewers, not me though. So we're gonna have a lot more details about this thing. And before we dive in, let me just tell you about the new Linux Shorts channel that I made, which is not talking about my shorts, but is making use of the Shorts feature of YouTube. Basically, you're gonna get almost every day a very short format video talking about the major Linux news that just happened. So if you like Linux news and don't want to wait for each week, you can subscribe to that new channel if you're interested. And if you're interested in keeping your server secure, you might want to take a look at today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by TuxCare and the day has finally come. CentOS 8 is now officially end of life. So it's not getting any patches for any new vulnerabilities in any of its packages. Unless you subscribe to TuxCare's extended lifecycle support service and get all these patches straight from TuxCare instead of getting them from the distro. This means that your systems will stay safe and compliant with all your security requirements while you plan for a migration to another system. Running without support gets expensive very quickly. Check out the calculator available in the TuxCare website to get an idea of just how expensive it can be. As the Log4j issues have shown, being at risk and being attacked is not something that happens in the movies or to others. All organizations need a strategy to stay safe. So click the link in the description below to subscribe to TuxCare's extended lifecycle support service and make sure that you can migrate off CentOS 8 at your own pace. Plasma 5.24 was released and if you haven't seen my dedicated video yet, I encourage you to click on it. If you just want the TLDR, here we go. Plasma now has a brand new overview effect that looks like the activities view of GNOME. It mixes your workspaces and your open windows and throws in a K-Run research field as well that's immediately active by default as soon as you hit the key combo. Folders will now follow the color you chose in the accent colors section so you get a nice colorful touch on Dolphin's icon and when navigating your file system. Plasma also now supports logging in and authenticating with your fingerprint and it fixes plenty of issues with multi-monitor support and Wayland on top of the continued work to make the system settings more legible and to make Discover, the App Center, work and look better. Speaking of which, Discover is finally getting a redesign because, let's be honest, it was starting to lag way behind GNOME's and elementary OS's solutions. The developers are starting with the app page that presents all the details for an application, and it seems like they're also going the same route as what GNOME or elementary did, with a better hierarchy of information, more space for screenshots and more importance given to the version, the size and the source, as well as the license. On the mockups, it still looks a bit bland and doesn't feel super modern to me, but that's just my opinion. And still on KDE Plasma, Plasma Mobile Gear 22.02 has been released. This update to the mobile version of Plasma brings a ton of enhancements, like a redesign of the settings panel and quick settings, a new task switcher that looks more in line with what iOS and Android offer, and supports gestures, or KRunner being accessible through a downward swipe on the home screen. Basically, everything you were expecting from a modern mobile operating system is now up to par. Except apps. We are still lacking tons and tons of apps. Still, the default ones have received a lot of attention and improvements to the general UX. I'm going to have to give Plasma Mobile another try really soon. Now, Peppermint OS is back from its hiatus. The founder of this distro passed away tragically last year and contributors reorganized and managed to put out a new version, Peppermint OS 11. It's a very lightweight distro that should just fly on older hardware and probably should fly even faster on modern hardware, I guess. Version 11 ditches the mishmash of desktop environments to just use XFCE and it rebased itself on Debian instead of Ubuntu. It adds a welcome screen that lets you pick which browser you want to install and add extra application and tools. There's a new Peppermint Hub which combines all settings in the same place and it comes with HBlock, a terminal-based system-wide ad blocker. So why don't you give it a shot on your potato PC and tell me how it went in the comments. Still on distros, System76 has released an update to their Pop! OS distribution. This one is interesting as it improves performance in games and desktop responsiveness. They basically added a new scheduler that optimizes process priorities depending on what Pop! Shell sees in the foreground 
so the windows that have the attention and focus are getting more CPU cycles and are more responsive. It apparently makes VR a lot smoother and boosts frame rates for most games, so technically you should already have the update if you're on Pop! OS. Ubuntu 22.04 may offer accent colors, while a bunch of other distros already offer them, like Elementary OS, Zorin OS, or anything using KDE, GNOME still doesn't have an upstream accent color implementation. It might happen with Libadvita in the future, though. In the meantime, Ubuntu seems willing to add their own, with a choice of 7 or 8 shades listed from the Ubuntu color palette. This feature isn't locked in yet and might not be available in 22.04, as that's a long-term support release, so anything not stable enough won't make the cut. Still, that's a very good feature that I wish every desktop environment and every distro used, and probably should be linked to a preference, just like the dark mode is, so your KDE apps could respect your accent color on GNOME, for example. GNOME 42 still holds a bunch of new things in store, apparently, and the latest one seems to be support for dark wallpapers. It will already support the global dark mode preference, compatible with KDE Plasma 5.24 or Elementary OS. But now going dark mode will also change the wallpaper to a dark variant, if you selected a wallpaper that ships both a light and a dark version. It's a small thing, but it's definitely going to make the desktop look a little bit more polished. Love those features. Falcon, the web browser made for KDE, finally got a new release, version 3.2. While they don't have a fancy release note with nice screenshots, they still added plenty of new stuff, including the ability to make a capture of a web page, an option to use an internal PDF viewer, and initial support for themes and extensions. Downloads can also now be paused and resumed, and tabs can be detached. Back when I used KDE, I had not gone for Falcon because it looked unmaintained, having received no changes in a few years, but it seems that there's still some good stuff happening, so I'll definitely give it a go when I come back to KDE. When? Not if. System76 released their Kudu laptop, which is a very, very thick boy. It's a 15-inch device with a full HD display, a Ryzen 9 5900HX CPU, and RTX graphics. The chassis looks similar to what I got on my Aurora prototype laptop, and while it's a very, very thick and heavy boy, it's also superbly cooled. So performance should be really nice on that portable workstation. It also has all the ports you'll ever need, with plenty of USB Type-A, USB Type-C, one mini display port, HDMI, a headphone jack, a microphone jack, and it even has two M.2 SSD slots for storage. Basically, it's a chongus that's designed for people who need to work and sometimes take that work with them. Sometimes. Christian Schaller, the director for desktop at Red Hat, wrote an interesting blog post about use case Linux distributions which basically means distros made to answer a specific use case, because the general distros don't fit that super well. He explains that just needing these specific distros is a failing of the Linux desktop, and that distributions should be able to tackle all purposes easily. I absolutely agree with his viewpoint, by the way. If you need to create a dedicated operating system just to include a few applications and tools that aren't easily available in all general purpose distros, then we have failed at making Linux user-friendly enough. For example, if we need a dedicated gaming distro that installs Lutris, Heroic, OBS, and Steam, and you can't replicate that in seconds on any distro, then we're basically still too complicated. It's a very interesting read. Check the link in the description below, like with every other article, basically. All the links are down there. Speaking of use case distros, Zorin OS 16 Education was released in its normal and light variant. It's basically just Zorin OS 16, with a bunch of pre-installed apps geared towards education, including Colibri, a huge library of educational content that can also work offline, and that lets educators create their own curriculums, including books, videos, and interactive lessons. And I must be a real huge nerd, because just reading those words and learning about it makes me want to go and build my own curriculum for any matter, even though I finished college more than 10 years ago. On top of that are Minder, the mind mapping tool, Foliate to read ebooks, OpenBoard, a whiteboard app, or Minuet, a music learning app. Do you know how to code and are you interested in Proton and Wine or just general Linux gaming? If so, then Codeweavers is looking for someone like you. They want programmers full time to improve Wine, Crossover, Proton, and projects specific to various Codeweavers clients. The proposition seems to be remote or based in the US, depending on where you live. Also, they don't mention even a salary range, which in my opinion should never be allowed anymore. 
The Steam Deck is being revealed bit by bit, and it seems that AMD's super sampling technology, called AMD Fidelity FX Super Resolution, or FSR, is being added to SteamOS's compositor, Gamescope. That's a lot of names and acronyms. This compositor is only used to launch games on SteamOS and the Steam Deck, and makes sure that everything is correctly displayed in full screen, allows spoofing a virtual screen and refresh rate, allows force resizing of a game's output, forcing an FPS limit, and more. With FSR, games that normally wouldn't run at higher resolutions on the deck will be able to use upscaling to fake it. Now that's probably going to be useful for the Steam Deck when it's plugged into an external monitor, but also maybe for future devices. And I mean a Steam console. Still on the Steam Deck, some lucky bastards got to get a review unit. And that doesn't include me. These guys have started putting the deck through its paces, and we got some nice benchmarks with really impressive performance even compared to way more expensive options like the Aya Neo or the One X Player. Battery life does not seem wonderful though, as a simple game like Dead Cells reaches 6 hours and control only lasts for 1.5 or 2 hours when running at 60 FPS, which isn't great in my opinion. Or maybe I'm just sour because I'm gonna have to wait for the end of the month before I can get mine and play my games. Speaking of which, there are now 243 games that are verified on the deck, and 412 games in total if you also include the playable titles. Valve is ramping up their assessment of titles, and we now have 243 verified games, which means that they will run perfectly on that handheld PC, and 169 nice playable titles, which means they'll run really well but might not be 100% optimized for the device form factor. Of course, that number is probably ramping up as you're watching this video, but still, Valve is gonna have to up their efforts if they really want most of Steam's library to be assessed before the Steam Deck ships into the hands of real consumers. They only have a month left. And finally, let's stay on gaming, with Tim Sweeney, CEO of Epic Games, stating on Twitter that easy anti-cheat isn't good enough in terms of Proton support to enable Fortnite to use it. Basically, he thinks that Fortnite is huge, and so there's a lot of incentive to cheat, and he's not confident that the solution his own company developed is enough to stop cheating with custom kernels and everything. That says a lot when the CEO of a company says publicly that the tool they developed isn't up to the task it was specifically developed for. Weird comment, Tim. Really weird. And that's it for this video. It was made possible by Slimbook, and these guys are making Linux laptops and desktops, and they're running an offer. You can get 150 euros off your Ultrabook called the Slimbook Executive. You can just use this offer code at checkout and benefit from that discount. It's a magnificent Ultrabook with a full magnesium chassis, a 3K screen, great keyboard. It's just a fantastic device. So check the link in the description below if you need one, because stocks are pretty limited. So thank you everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, turn on notification, and launch comments at me from the comment section. And if you didn't like the video, you can also dislike and launch more comments at me. Be aggressive, it only helps the video perform better, so go ahead. And if you really want to help support my channel, you can also join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members, or one or the other. Both get access to the same benefits. You get a weekly Patreon cast, you get the right to vote on the next topics I cover, you can get your name in the credits, and you might even get some future Q&As in livestream form or more stuff like that. I'm running a poll on the Patreon page and the YouTube page to check if people are interested in more perks. So check it out now. In the meantime, thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!